yeah. Uh, I tested my mic and stuff, and it all worked. Here, let me unmute you. There you go. Unmute you. You're, you're muted, I think. Oh, you're still muted. Still muted. Still muted. Wow. Can you hear me? Oh, wow. Well. Okay, how's that? There we go. Yay, us. <laughs> <laughs> Almost like we were technicians or something and could figure stuff out, right? Jesus. <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, sad. I guess I'm too old or something. I don't know. Let me no, know. never trying, too old. I'm trying to get the chat panel open. Hang on a second. I'm still not totally familiar with this thing. Uh, stand by, brother. Oh, wow, that's weird. Uh, 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 uh. Uh, hello, Brad. Hello, everybody. Hang on. Um, oh, my gosh. I cannot figure out how to do open the chat window. Stand by. Panel options. Oh, for goodness sake. Uh, wow, that's weird. Hey, 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 John, type something for me. Just type something. See if it shows up. Yeah. Hey, Paul. Hi. How are you? Yeah, there you go, John. Okay. Oh, that's weird. I don't actually see the... Hey, Paul. I don't actually see the, the chat panel. Oh, I guess I should put my own uh, thing on. Hang on a sec, bro. Hang on. Uh, <clears throat> hey, Tuan. Tuan. Hey, we haven't met. Hi. How are you? I'm um, good. How are you? Yeah, fine. Thanks very much. Thanks. Thanks. Let me get set up. Where are you, Twan? Yeah, I'm in um, Los Angeles. Oh, okay. Brought, brought up in Los Angeles, brought up in Canoga Park. Uh, hang on, let me get my split screen going here. Hang on a second. Hang on, hang on. Oh, gosh. I'm not doing very well today. Oh, there we go. Oh, wow, that's weird. So there were two meetings. Oh, that's weird. There were two meetings started and it didn't start one and it started the other. Wow. That's yeah, weird. I was trying to log off for the last 15 minutes. I couldn't log yeah, off. I'm so sorry. You know, and I logged, Paul, I logged, I, I, I started early actually. I turned it on and I thought, oh, everybody will just want to. We just want to wait, and it'll be all good. And I apologize for that. Apologize. Not a big deal. Yeah. So stand by. I'm still trying to figure something out. Stand by. I'm just. I can't. I can't open the, the chat window. You know the. There it is. Okay. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. Okay. Um. So are you guys seeing me? Are you seeing me? All right. Everything okay? I don't see you yet. Oh. Oh. Really. The logo. Oh really? Well, hang on. That's stupid. Hang on. There you go. There you are. Yeah, but that isn't what I want because you can see everything. <laughs> <laughs> stand by. Yeah, stand by. I don't want you seeing everything in my house. You know, it's funny that X split doesn't work. Stand by. Stand by. Stand by. I'm just gonna. I'm just gonna. There you go. This. Do you see me? Yep. Yeah. Is the X split thing on the back? Weird background thing. Yeah, you got your uh, yeah. PC PCB. In the background now. Okay, good. Yeah. Wow, I don't know why I can't find it. Uh, oh, there I am. Yay. <laughs> okay. Uh, crazy. So, um, uh, let me just make sure that I turn the recording on. Stand by, please. I uh, know I haven't. Yes, I have. Okay, so we're recording now, and this is CRT workshop number three, and uh, welcome everybody. Uh, I have no plans whatsoever. Uh, Tuan, you're new. Do you have questions? Do you have any questions? No, uh, I, I just was watching the other videos, and um, I mean, I have a, a few CRTs that need to be fixed, so um, I guess I'm just getting started into the, the whole repair side of this. Wow. Do you, have, do you have no electronic background whatsoever? No. Uh, I have a couple of grades. But, but, oh, um, my. Really? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, 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 do you own a digital multimeter and soldering tools? Yeah, yeah. Things like yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I have uh, soldering iron and um, okay. multimeter. I was about to buy one of those ESR. Um, ESR meter. 
Yeah, yeah, you know, it's either you own an ESR meter or you simply replace all the capacitors. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. They're, you know, shotgunning all the, we call it shotgunning, just taking them out and just sticking in new ones. There's nothing wrong with that if you can solder, which is the most important skill you can possibly have. Um, I try to help people on the phone troubleshoot stuff, and it's extremely difficult when it's a bad connection somewhere. I'm looking for bad parts and so it's pretty easy to talk to somebody talk someone through diagnosing bad parts but when something's not connected or connected when it shouldn't be there's almost no way to troubleshoot something like that by remote control by the phone anyway so so practice 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 that's uh, 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 that's real important so uh, hey I have a question for Brad thank you very much an increasing number of flybacks that are slowly becoming <laughs> an obtainium oh god you know when I watched uh, what was it Avatar and they mentioned that they said oh we're looking for this element it's called unobtainium Right then, I knew I was doomed. I knew there wasn't going to be no science in this show whatsoever. <laughs> uh, it's pretty funny. Uh, anyway, um, so, uh, no, you can't rebuild a flyback, Brad. No, there's no way you can rebuild a flyback transformer. This is a manufacturing thing. And unfortunately, of course, all that manufacturing is now Chinese. And unfortunately, what they're trying to do, I think, I'm not sure, is they, and this is typical, they take a sample of something and then they depot it. There's a solution you can put the, the, the flyback in that uh, that dissolves the potting, the, the resin that's around it. And then they look at how it's built and they measure the inductance of the coils and the resistance and they try to build something that kind of sort of works. The issue with that, as far as I know, and you know, this is all just my experience and maybe my, I try not to be opinionated, but this is what I believe, is that the horizontal circuit is extremely well tuned. The horizontal output circuit depends on a combination of capacitors, and these are not electrolytic capacitors, these are the polystyrene capacitors that you see that are like 0 0.0039 and a, a kilovolt and stuff like that. They're, they're known as, let me step aside, either the retrace tuning capacitor or something known as the S shaping capacitor. I'm not going to get into details right now, but it's a really tuned circuit which consists of coils and capacitors, and it's really looking to resonate at, at uh, 15,734 hertz. I mean, that's the thing. So, so if they manufacture it just a little bit off, and or as these things age, your capacitors, not electrolytic, these other ones, which usually are okay, uh, start to change value. You end up with a monitor that works, but the horizontal output transistor is really working its ass off. It just is just working really, really hard. Um, one thing I always suggest you do, man, when you when you have, or even if you don't have issues, it it's not a bad idea to make a point periodically when the monitor is on. Just relax for a second, of touching the horizontal output transistor and checking its temperature, just so you know what's normal. You have to be careful. You can't be grounded. You can't touch anything else, but you can touch the metal case of horizontal output transistor, which is the largest transistor near the fly that transformer and or if you're really paranoid turn it off and and then touch it and see what's normal for how hot these things run uh, they run pretty warm but if you have some sort of an issue with a weird flyback that's not exactly well manufactured or some other issue uh, your monitor could be, work, be working perfectly, but you touch the horizontal output transistor. Oh man, that thing is really, really hot. I have an issue. Before you blow crap up, turn the dang thing off and try to figure out what that might be. And I'll tell you, it's the most difficult part of the circuit to work on. For those of you that, you know, I mean, a lot of you guys just replace the flybacks automatically. You just, you, you've got some vertical deflection problem and you're changing the flyback, which I don't understand why you do that. But there's nothing wrong with putting in new parts in general as long as they're properly manufactured. But I cannot say where, uh, Brad, to get back to your question, I cannot say 
um, where we might be able to, I can say that you won't be able to rebuild them. And, um, and I'm not sure what you mean by the issues with the pots. You mean the screen pot and the focus pot? Is that what you're talking about, Brad? Are you on audio or chat? Oh, okay. Um, and, and what do you mean by that? Because I haven't seen those fail. Do you mean that you don't have the range of focus or the range of brightness that you think you should have? Typey type, Brad. Do you not have a mic, Brad? Typey type. Mavis teaches typing. Uh, uh, huh. Yeah, hmm, you know, it's so sealed up. I mean, certain actually, I don't think it could actually be dirty. Um, wow. Um, Andy, I've seen this failure quite a few times, what he's talking about. And you replace uh, the pots and the problem goes away, Paul? Well, if the pots are in great, integrated on the flyback, I just replace the whole flyback, and it's usually fixes the problem. Sometimes oh. uh, when the chassis is running, you can just touch the pot with your finger, and it'll uh, go out of focus, or it'll start getting uh -huh. bright or dim. Uh -huh. Okay, well, I may be standing... Well, not exactly corrected, but that's informative, Paul. Thank you. Because, you know, I haven't actually worked on lots of collector old monitors in ages and ages and ages. So the problems that I was seeing 20 years ago, you know, you've compounded. They are now compounded by yeah, these yeah, issues definitely. for sure. And things are failing that you wouldn't normally. So what I was going to suggest, Paul, before you popped in, and thank you very much, was that a lot of these issues are CRT issues. I mean, they are just old as hell and and drifting around in, in emission and focus, and they're soft and, you know, that kind of stuff. But but thanks, on. Uh, thanks very much, Paul. appreciate that. Sure. Uh, I don't know I what also, to say there. Uh, when I when I rebuild a monitor and keep the flyback on, I will uh, let it run for about six hours, seven, eight hours, and see if there's any focus drift or uh, brightness drift. Yeah. And if there is, then I replace the flyback. Oh, oh. And what are you paying for these now? Forty, forty-five? Uh, they usually range between thirty-five and forty bucks right now. Well, you know that's sure. completely reasonable. I mean, we've paid in the past a hundred bucks for uh, Hantarex flybacks. You know, if you e even when they were being manufactured, they were pretty expensive. So it's interesting that these remanufactured flybacks are a available and b kind of reasonably priced. You know, I can see why you f you collector folks toss them on in. Just toss it in. See if it see if it helps. And it uh, couldn't hurt, right? Couldn't hurt. And if the old one, if it doesn't change it, the old one you took out ostensibly is good, right? Uh, I guess you could put it in something else, but I I don't like reusing used parts. I, uh, mostly I don't. Anyway. So there you go. So uh, Agamas, more? Anything? Other questions? Ding. I got a question, Randy. Yeah. Um, I texted you uh, um, earlier this week about uh, U2000 and U5000s. Well, actually, you already touched on it a little bit uh, about the hots getting really uh, overheated. And, uh, oh, yes. Yes, I, I'm sorry I didn't respond to that. Now, um, I, yes, I, I, I'm going to go to the board in just a second and talk about that just a little bit uh, right now. Um, but the thing that bothers me is you said you've already replaced all the electrolytics, and yet you still yeah. have this problem. So yeah. I, I don't exactly know the answer to this. But let me launch into something that I think would be interesting, unless someone has something else to say at the moment. Uh, I, I think this is interesting. And I have an article on this, and it's called When Horizontal Drive Goes Bad. That's, that's where I'm headed right now. And... Uh, and uh, let, let, let's do this thing here. Let's see if this works. Hi. All right. Um, so this is now delving into uh, CRT, I'm sorry, uh, transistor theory pretty heavily. If you don't have any idea about how a transistor works, this might lose you. I'll be as gentle as I possibly can. So let's first of all take a look at the horizontal deflection circuit, which is pretty much the same in every monitor that you work on, pretty much. And uh, the way it starts out is with some sort of a horizontal 
oscillator, O-S-C-I-L-L-A-T-O-R. An oscillator is a circuit that generates alternating current. You give it a DC power supply, typically it's, uh, you know, plus 12 volts DC, and what comes out of the horizontal oscillator is the horizontal frequency, which as you should know, is 15,750 hertz approximately. It's really 15,734 hertz if we were talking about a real honest to goodness, what's known as NTSC video, the standard video that we um, that we used in uh, in video games of this era and, and in television before we had a uh, high definition TV. So there's where the high frequency thingy comes from. And in my experience, the oscillator chip is really reliable. Yeah. I, I, anyway, so. So the, the 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 signal that comes out of that is really precise. It's fifteen thousand seven hundred hertz, seven hundred fifty hertz, but it's very weak. It has to be amplified. So the horizontal <coughs> the horizontal oscillator then connects to what's known as the horizontal drive transistor. So it's always an NPN transistor with a grounded emitter. It's what we refer to as a ground switch. So this transistor is known as the horizontal drive transistor. It is a sometimes failure, but it isn't really it isn't really a super common failure. It can fail sometimes. It's sort of a medium-sized transistor. It's not as big as the horizontal output transistor is, the big giant transistor that's on the side by the flyback transformer, but it's somewhat larger than the little itty-bitty T092 packages, those little black transistors with the flat sides on them. It's somewhat bigger than that. Anyway, so the horizontal drive transistor then um, connects to the primary winding of the little transformer. It's called the horizontal drive transformer. Let me see, I'll write it on here. It's called the horizontal drive transformer, abbreviated XFMR, transformer. And and that kind of sort of goes up to, in the era of the monitors you're working on, connects up to the B plus through a resistor. It's not, it's, it's not a common failure. But typically, there's a fairly high wattage resistor here. Let me see. Can you, can you see? You can't see up that high, can you? Let me, uh, oh, no, that's it. Yeah. Let, me, let me tilt this here just a little bit here. I need to stand by. I need to make my monitor a little bigger here. Hang on. Oh, goodness, I made it smaller. Stand by. Boy, how do I, how do I change that? Fuck. Sorry. <laughs> Pardon me. Uh, all right, well, that's pretty good. I was just trying to avoid that light reflection. All right, so, uh, so now you can see this, correct? Everybody okay? Yep. All yeah, right, good. All good. Right. Th thank you. All right, so this typically connects up to what we refer to as the B+, plus. as you know, the main power supply in the monitor, 120 volts or 130, whatever it is, we commonly refer to it as the B plus for reasons I don't care to go into. Yeah, so this is a fairly high wattage resistor. Typically that's, you know, it might be 3.9K, it might be a couple of watts or something like that. Not a, not a failure item. So this little transformer is a step down transformer. This is a little horizontal drive transformer. It's just a little like an inch square, an inch cube. Um, that sits right near the horizontal output transistor. And it's a really important thing. It's doing a couple of things for us. Number one, it is lowering the voltage because this thing is about to connect right to the base of the horizontal output transistor. So this transistor is the horizontal output transistor. And again, it's an NPN transistor with a grounded emitter. But it, and here's the important thing, wake up, wake up, for those of you that aren't familiar with transistor theory, it only takes seven tenths of a volt to turn that sucker on. With a grounded emitter like that, this is a, what's known as a common emitter amplifier setup, um, 
uh, if the emitter is at zero volts, which it is right now, the base of an NPN transistor is only seven tenths of a volt higher than the emitter to get the transistor to turn on. And uh, oh, sorry, and the lead with the arrow. Sorry, for those of you that totally know, don't know anything, the lead with the arrow is called the emitter. The lead without the arrow on that side is known as the collector. And then this thing that I put the 0.7 on here, this is the controlling element, and it's known as the base of the transistor. It has nothing to do with how physically it looks. It's just electrically known as the base. I have no idea why they call it the base. Uh, but it only takes 7 tenths of a volt. So here we have 120 volts DC or something like that. And even though it's going through a resistor, it's still really high. We can't connect that right to the base of a transistor. We have to step the voltage down. So that horizontal drive transistor right there, uh, transformer is a step down transformer that is real high frequency, 15,750, that steps it down from 120 down to like 7 tenths of a volt. But here's the deal, and here's, Paul, the answer to your question. And the question was, gee whiz, how is it, why is it that sometimes we put in horizontal output transistors and they get super hot and or just fail right away? And this is one of the things that can cause that. So, um, so um, here's the thing. In order to turn on the transistor, we have to put approximately seven tenths of a volt on the base, but it has to be able to provide a fair amount of current. In a transistor circuit like this, the bigger the load is, that is, the more that it's trying to drive, like, for example, the flyback transformer and the coil in the yoke, the more current it takes on the base to drive it. Let me repeat that. The more amps of current that are being drawn by the, drawn by the, uh, the load itself, which is the primary winding of the flyback transformer and stuff like that, the higher the base current has to be, not the voltage, the voltage stays at 0.7, but the more current you need. It's known as the reverse transfer characteristics of the transistor. And again, one more time, just to repeat it, the bigger the load, the more base current you need. The analogy would be, hi, the analogy would be, um, your automobile. If you hang a big load on the on the automobile, like let's say you hook a trailer up to the automobile, you have to push the accelerator pedal down further to get the same speed, don't you? In other words, the bigger the load, the, the heavier the trailer is, the more gas it takes. So it's the same thing here. The, the bigger the trailer is here, the load here, the more gas it takes. And, and by that, I mean current, uh, not voltage. Uh, to drive. So here's the deal. And Paul, you've already eliminated this problem by replacing capacitors, but here's the deal. Yep. The very uh, and so I don't know the answer to your problem. Uh, but very often you will see connected to the primary winding of the transformer here a capacitor, an electrolytic capacitor that you're going to change. And a typical value for that, oh gosh, it varies. Um, you know, uh, 47 microfarads, uh, 100 microfarads, you know, at whatever voltage it needs to be. The, the purpose of that is this. In order for this to transistor to turn on properly, it has to be fully turned on. And that's known as being saturated. Uh, can you see up here? Paul, can you see up here if I write no, up here? No. No? Uh, down here? You can see here? lower. A little lower. Here, here, yeah. yeah. There you go. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> saturated. S-A-T-U-R-A-T-E-D. Saturated. When a transistor is fully turned on, as much as it can possibly turn on, be turned on, we refer to that transistor as being saturated. And it has to be because you cannot afford to keep this transistor operating in what's known as its linear region. A trans and again, if you if you don't know anything about transistor theory, I apologize. I'm gonna lay a crap ton of really kind of advanced transistor theory on on you really fast here. Uh, but here's the deal: a transistor is like a switch. 
it can be all the way off like a switch. It can be all the way on like a switch. Or it can be anywhere in between. In other words, it can be anywhere from an infinite number of ohms, a million, zillion, billion ohms between the collector and emitter. Or the collector and emitter can be completely connected together, meaning there's almost no resistance there. Or it can be anywhere in between the two. Anything from infinite volt resistance down to 100K, 10K, 1K, 100 ohms. I mean, it can be any resistance that we want it to be. So if this horizontal drive is insufficient in, firm, in terms of current, it will be operating in its very dangerous linear region, which will generate a ton of heat. Because anytime you run electric current through a resistor, you generate heat, as you know. That's the way toasters work and air dryers and all that kind of stuff. So the purpose of this capacitor right here, whatever's hanging on the primary winding of the, the drive transistor, is to provide a very low impedance source, as we call it, a very low resistance, a good, really good bodacious source of current that is extremely close to the load, which in this case is the primary winding of the transformer. It's kind of bad mojo to have the power supply be really far away and go through a resistor before you get to the load. Um, because as the load draws more or less current, this, this current here becomes unstable. So, and, and, and you could not have enough current. So by adding this capacitor here, in between pulses, the capacitor charges up. And then when it wants to trigger the horizontal output transistor, it dumps that charge and, and, and to ground. And we build a nice big magnetic field. And then it collapses and it turns on the HOT. So, um, so one of the things, I mean, you do this automatically without really knowing what you're doing. But if you're interested in how stuff actually works, instead of just making it work, if you just want to make it work, throw in the caps, it'll work, maybe. Um, uh, so this is one of those things that you automatically fix, but that's really the point behind it. But um, Paul, I don't, I, you know, I don't, I, other than um, maybe detuning uh, due to, um, the capacitors changing values, all the S shaping capacitor, the the ver the uh, retrace tuning capacitor, the one that's in parallel with the horizontal output transistor. Um, if those change value, that's an issue, and I don't have a good way to test those. I have kind of, well, Rick, other than replacing them, I got no idea how to test them. Well, with these older uh, chassis from the '90s, uh, I've noticed that the, the horizontal transistor, if I let it run. I got my uh, thermometer right here. Yeah, I have one of those. I use it. It's great. Uh, I the temperature, it. If I don't have a fan on it, it'll exceed 150 degrees Celsius. And I think that, yeah, and that's the limit of the that's the temperature uh, limit right there. Oh, that's very hot. Holy cow! Yeah, Celsius this, or Fahrenheit. Fahrenheit. Oh, okay. All right. It's been the that's uh. The limit of the temperature of the, the transistor, that's its uh, uh, base right there, base uh, limit of uh, 150 degrees. So uh, if I have a fan on it, it'll stay nice and cool. It'll stay at about 100 degrees. So it's there's something uh, amiss in that circuit that's uh, causing the For sure. Guys to For sure. For sure. I'm seeing this more and more. Yeah, um, yeah, I don't have any personal insight into that other than the fact that, you know, I swapped those capacitors when I was doing a lot of this stuff. You know, I had a ton of junk chassis. And if I had an HOT that was, you know, getting hot or weird, but I've done all the, everything else, I'll just stick in all those caps and see if the problem goes away. And usually it did. Uh, but these days, I don't know what to tell you. I mean, unless you have a really good cap meter, not not an ESR meter, but a, one that can measure 0 0.003. Three nine, like the LC one hundred three. I think right, do right. that. Yeah. Uh, maybe I should try some uh, super low impedance caps uh, for like the forty seven UF and one hundred UF. Yeah, like, yeah, know. those are always good. Of course, we talked about Nichicon capacitors previously, and you definitely want that or Panasonic uh, if possible. Uh, you could certainly try that. Uh, do you have a oscilloscope? Yes, I do. Can you? Why don't you scope the collector of the horizontal output transistor and see if it's being... Oh, no, that won't do it. Never mind. Bad, bad, bad idea. Bad idea. 
Uh, have you scoped the base of the HOT when this happens, when they get warm? Actually, I haven't needed to use my oscilloscope in years. Uh oh, uh, yeah, I don't either. I don't either. So uh, uh, I'd have to dig it out and uh, make sure it still even works. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, uh, this next question then, Paul, I mean, you're obviously you're, you're pretty experienced here. Uh, if you read this other question from Brad about uh, horizontal output transistors, um, the specs that I look at, let me just switch to the board, Brad, and, and then, and then uh, Paul, just hang on a second. You can give your, your input sure. on this because I'm sure, I'm sure you've looked at lots of these things. Uh, stand by, please. Let me just erase the board. You know, uh, replacing horizontal output transistors is tricky. You could have one that you think the specs are perfectly good and and uh, and it doesn't work. <laughs> I mean, the bottom line is it doesn't last. So, uh, transistor specs. There are a lot of transistor specs, transistor specifications, right? Um, but there's only a few that I'm really concerned about. And uh, the first one I want to look at is V sub CEO. So the, this specification for a transistor, what it means is that this is the maximum voltage, V for voltage, that the transistor can handle between the collector and the emitter with the base open. So it's pronounced V sub CEO, and this thingy that I've drawn, these little letters underneath here, for those of you that don't know, this is known as a subscript. And the, the subscript is used to further describe what you mean by the big letter. Like, uh, okay, it's the voltage rating of the transistor. What voltage rating are we talking about? Because there's three of them. I'll get to that in a second. It's the maximum voltage that the transistor can handle between the collector and the emitter when the base is open, meaning it's not hooked up to anything. Well, naturally, if the base is not hooked up to anything, the transistor is off, isn't it? You have to hook up the base, which is the controlling element, to turn on a transistor. So we should have like an infinite resistance here, just, just infinite resistance there. This specification is how much voltage can this transistor handle before it arcs between the collector and emitter. And if you, I, I highly suggest you either go online and look at pictures of transistor dies or cut one open, just cut the top off of a TO3 package and see the transistor inside. It's an itty teeny weeny little chip of silicon. It's only, you know, or five millimeters or something like that. Uh, anyway, and it's full of these little, tr uh, they're, they're islands of silicon, basically. And there's little bits of insulation in between them, silicon. Uh, how much voltage can this transistor handle before it arcs between the little elements and destroys itself? That's, that's kind of what that specification is. So it's called V sub CEO, and it is the main specification for the transistor, the main voltage. And anytime you have a voltage measurement, a voltage rating for a transistor, uh, you can always use one of the same or higher voltage. So it's perfectly okay to go up in V sub CEO if you want. You can go, kind of go up as high as you want, really. Um, I don't know, Paul, what's typical of V sub CEO for the ones that we're using, that you're using a lot? They're like 900 kilovolts, something like that? Do you recall? Um, I think they are 1,500. They right? could be. They could be. So they're in nice high voltage. So yeah. there are some yeah. other voltage ratings for transistors that typically, as a technician, I don't care about. The engineers, I think this is important to them, maybe. I don't know. I'm not an engineer. But 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 there's some other ratings, and I'm just telling you these so you can ignore them, I think, pretty much. And one of them is V sub CBO. That's maximum voltage of the transistor between collector and base with the emitter open. I don't know why you need to know that. I don't need to know that. And uh, the other one is uh, V sub EBO, the maximum voltage between emitter and base with the collector open. I don't, you know, I don't know why we need to know those. I don't think we do. So, so this is the first specification, V sub CEO. The second specification is the current rating of the transistor. And 
uh, again, for those of you maybe uninitiated, we use the letter I to denote current. I know that seems stupid, but early pioneers in electronics thought of current as intensity. Uh, so we use the letter I for current still to this day. So there's also a little subscript here, and it's called I sub C. I for current, what current? The collector current. So that's the main current flow in a transistor. In a transistor, we have the collector, the emitter, and the base. The base is the control turning it on and off, but the main current flows through the transistor like this. Kind of comes in the, does come in the collector and kind of out the emitter. It follows the arrow here. Um, so there's a current rating for the transistor. It's called I sub C. It's the collector current. Same thing. That has to be the same or higher. So as you're looking at this part, you, you, you look at a part, you go, can I use this? I don't know. Let's look at its V sub CEO, same or higher. Let's look at I sub C. However, there's one more specification that you got to be aware of, and it's important. And it's a weird thing. So hang on as I explain this. I mean, uh, well, well, we'll see how well you do here understanding this. So it's something known as H sub FE. Sorry, I did that wrong. Sorry. It's H, lowercase h, sub FE. And what's weird about this is the H is lowercase h, but it's big in size. But subscripts are always tiny, and the subscripts are capitalized. So it's called H sub FE. And what H sub FE is, is something known as the, the gain of the transistor. Or more correctly, it's known as the current gain of the transistor. So it's, we just call it the gain, G-A-I-N, but, but, but it's actually known as the current gain of the transistor. It is also known as the beta of the transistor, the beta, the beta, the second letter in the Greek alphabet, beta. So what the, what the H sub FE, the gain, let me just call it the gain, what the gain of the transistor is, is sort of its ability to amplify. Let me just sit down for a second. Stand by. Um, so what gain is, is like how sensitive the transistor is. How itty bitty of a signal can we put on the base to control much larger amounts of current between the collector and emitter? As I just mentioned earlier, I just went through this little bit of a lecture that it takes more current to drive it if there's a bigger load. So the gain of the transistor is how itty bitty of a signal can I put on the thing to get a certain amount of current going between the collector and emitter, and you need to try to match the gain. It doesn't have to be exactly perfect. In other words, if the gain of the transistor that came out was 40, and the one you're sticking in there is 50, I mean, if it's off by 10 or even 20%, it'll probably work, but you, you want to try to match the gain. If it's too far off, eh, things are going to blow up. It's going to be horrible. It's not going to work. It's not going to work. Um, uh, no, it's kind of unpredictable what it's going to do. depends on the kind of transistor you put in. And I think the bottom line is, Brad, and we'll ask, I'll ask Paul to comment on this, is you got to try them. You got to get some transistors from a certain source and toss them in and see how they're doing. You know, I mean, if I buy a 2SD870 for a horizontal output transistor, I'm looking for a nice, big, beefy, bit of new old stock from somewhere, but I don't know where these things come from these days. Paul, what's your comment in this regard? Randy, I appreciate you explaining this because it was actually a question of mine as well, uh, because I you get this big old data sheet on your original transistor, and you're yeah. trying to match it up with other transistors, and a, a lot of the stuff is the same, but then you'll get uh, a few things that are a little off, and you're like, eh, is that going to work or not? Um, but I you try to invest the ten bucks or twenty bucks, I think, and, and just try it and see if it works. I um, because and we talked about counterfeit parts and stuff like that. I mean, there's lots of cheap, crappy parts. I always tried to stay away from NTE when I was working on stuff. The last thing I ever wanted to do was buy an NTE or even an ECG part. Uh, Paul, we don't need to see your stomach there, bro. Oh, sorry. 
sorry. <laughs> that was, thank you. <laughs> uh, uh, anyway, so. Uh, I got, if, uh, this is a uh, transistor out of a 7400, K7400. Right. Yeah. That's normal size transistor. This is what I've been using. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And uh, it puts the job great. And since I've uh, sent out, I think I've used 20 of these so far, and none of them have failed so far. So uh, can, you, can you jot down the uh, the part number in the in the chat? Sure, absolutely. Yeah, I'm surprised it's a 2SC. I would have thought it'd be a 2SD, but that, that I guess that's interesting. That's that, that's interesting. Uh, they've yeah, been working you... great for me. Oh, you got to get a the insulator to fit those, though, because they're huge. Yeah. The correct insulator. Yeah. You know, it's funny. It's one of those things in my whole career. I've never bought an insulator. You know, I've always just stolen it off of junk. Uh, plenty of junk laying around. But, you know, those those are really nice, beefy transistors. Uh, uh, really nice. Uh, any other questions? Everybody? Anybody? I have no plans for today. If you don't have questions, we're not going anywhere. No? Uh, pretty much got all me all my questions covered. <laughs> all right. Well, listen, uh, we don't have to do two hours. You know, you know, I'm happy to close it down. I got things to do. That's fine. All right. Thank I, you. I, I got a question. Yes. Who's this? Who speaks? John. John. Okay. Hey, John. Uh, there you are. This. This might be really basic, but I understand ground for the hot and the cold and the, and the the neutral from the earth. However, one thing I don't quite get or feel uncomfortable because I don't quite understand it is the actual ground being hooked up to the chassis or the frame of the monitor. I, a lot of a lot of cases I get there, it's not hooked up. They, it looks like it's well, it's been disconnected, and I'm like, well, do I hook it up? Do I not hook it up? I, I don't quite understand. It scares the crap out of me, actually, because I I don't. But I'm, is it supposed to be? It's supposed to be hooked up, like the from the earth ground from the from the wall outlet. Like we're isolating the chassis, and then we're hooking up the earth ground from the wall to the actual frame of the monitor. Okay, that's a that's a reasonable question, and uh, and uh, uh, I also have an article on that. Oh, let me mark this down. Hang on, <clears throat> hang on a second. Uh, uh, hang on a sec. I, let me make a note. When H drive, these are just things I'm going to post uh, in just a second. And ground. Uh, no, it's an excellent question, uh, John. And I didn't even know the answer to this question until I did research on an article. I, did, I actually called San Diego Gas and Electric. I live in San Diego uh, to find out what the deal was with ground. So um, so this will take about 15 minutes if everybody wants to relax for a sec. Uh, Absolutely, uh, sure. All right, stand by. Okay. I do have to figure out how to make my monitor work. I can't, I don't see myself. I see a little tiny piece of myself, but all right. Um, so let me just look here. Let's see. Uh, do we see the whole top of the board? We do not. No. Okay, a little let higher. Get, let me get up to the top. How's that? <clears throat> top of the board? Top of the board? Yeah. Do we yes, see top that? Top of the board. Visible. Okay. How far down do we see here to here? Yeah. Okay. Do we see any lower? Is that it right there? Is that the Yeah, bottom? pretty much. Pretty okay. much. All right, cool. All right. So here's the deal. In almost all of the old monitors that you're working on, they have linear power supplies, as you know. And these are what are known as hot chassis monitors for the reason that's coming up here shortly. Uh, can, you can see the whole width of the board, though, can't you? Can you see the air? Yeah. Okay, yep. cool. All right, cool. All right. So um, the AC power comes in, goes through the primary fuse, and it doesn't go to a transformer first. The very first thing it goes to is the bridge rectifier. The four diodes in the K7000, what is it, D18, 19, 20, and 21, I guess, somewhere. Mm -hmm. right. So in a bridge rectifier, it converts alternating current into direct current, as you know, and Right here where the two cathodes of these two diodes are tied together, 
That's the positive output of a bridge rectifier. Here's the negative output of the bridge rectifier, and it is connected to the chassis. Notice the chassis ground symbol there, right? So let's now take a look. Ooh, I might have to move this over. Um, yeah. Uh, sorry, I didn't give myself enough room. Stand by. Let me let me let me let me start over here. Um, the way your AC power works coming from the, the the pole is that there's a transformer that's got like 1,200 volts AC or something on one side, and on the other side here in America, uh, um, it's a center tapped transformer. The center tap is connected to the earth ground. And then we've got a two phases, as they're known. We have the two phases, uh, 120 volts out of that phase or 120 volts out of that phase. And as you know, the way they wire a house is you want to balance the load. Half of your appliances and other stuff should be on one phase and half should be on the other so you don't overload one side, blah, 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 blah. So this is what's coming from the AC power. Now, let's hook this up to that bridge rectifier thingy that I that I just showed you. Let me get a better pen. Stand by. So let's connect this now up to that bridge rectifier. Oh, through the fuse. So here's the bridge rectifier. There's the positive output of the bridge. There's the negative output of the bridge <clears throat> that is connected to the chassis. Now, imagine with no isolation transformer, what's going to happen here. At the, at the breaker panel, the circuit breaker panel, let's say. Sorry, let me back up. You know that the way our AC power works is that you have a short slot, which is the hot side of the AC power, and I did this wrong. I did this wrong. Sorry, I have 220 volts going to the thing. Sorry. This is just one of the phases. Sorry, uh, that was confusing me. Uh, we have the hot side of the AC power. That's the 120 volts AC. That's the short slot. The long slot is known as neutral, as you know. The, the hot side is where the black wire is connected. The neutral is where the white wire is connected. Um, and the neutral is zero volts. That's what's known as the return path. Theoretically, I should be able to stick my tongue in that slot with bare feet on wet concrete and I won't get a shock. And then, as you know, this half round thing is the earth ground. It's the earth ground. It's it's the ground that is the ground that, that the pole is, is grounded to. And here's the important thing. At the breaker panel, the earth ground and the neutral are connected together. The earth ground goes to the outside of things. In a video game, it's all the metal things that are exposed to the customer. Um, and uh, and uh, um, and so you know, and the new sorry, the outside, the earth ground goes. Everybody okay? The earth ground goes to the outside so that you don't get a shock. The neutral goes to the inside to all the electronics. But these guys are connected together. So imagine that this is the hot side of the AC power. This is the neutral side right here. And imagine now if we hook this up to earth ground, since neutral and ground are connected together, if I connect an earth ground to this thing, I am shorting out that diode. I am just hardwiring it with a dead short. And this is, may has happened, have happened to you. It's happened to me where I have act, I've plugged a monitor right into AC power with no isolation, which I do all the time to work on them, not a problem. But I accidentally touched my grounded soldering iron tip to the chassis. And it just flashed it just one tiny little second. And what it does is the current flows through this diode in the opposite direction right through this diode and right back to hot, that overloads this diode and blows it instantly. Now it is dead short. 
and um, and then the, the, both the negative ones are shorted, and this trace gets vaporized off the board. Maybe you've seen that, Paul. I don't know if you've seen it. You probably yeah, have. I've seen it. I've seen it. It's just vaporized. It's gone. No big deal. I mean, you can fix it. It's really, it's really not a big deal. But, um, but typically, these two negative going diodes um, uh, short out, short circuit. Uh, and depending on which side is hot and neutral, it may or may not blow the fuse. That's the deal. It, it can bypass the fuse completely, just go right through there, right to ground. It's not going through the fuse anywhere. The, the diode becomes the fuse. It just blow and the trace is the fuse. It just uh, it just vaporizes. I mean, really, there's nothing left of that trace. It's just vaporized. You might see a little curly bit of it, but pretty much not. So, uh, Don, answer number one, why, why we need the isolation coming up here is that we don't want that to happen, obviously. So now we're going to add the isolation transformer. So when we add the isolation transformer, we no longer have any ground connection at all. This is, we refer to this as being floating. That is, it's not referenced to ground in any way. Um, and I could touch either side, even though there's 120 volts AC coming out of this, if I was personally grounded and touched either side, I wouldn't get a shock because there's no return path for the electrical current. This is how a bird can sit on a high voltage power line and not get Kentucky fried. There's there's no complete circuit. His whole body's at 1,200 volts or 120,000 volts. It doesn't matter. The bird is just sitting up there on the wire because the, that, that output is not referenced to ground. He's not referenced to ground in any way, I should say. So now we have 120 volts AC with no ground reference whatsoever. So then we connect this up to the monitor. And again, there's a fuse, of course, and the bridge rectifier. Uh, and I'm not sure why I'm drawing this, uh, just to guess for your reference. Like that. This is connected now to uh, not only the chassis, but now we can safely connect the metal chassis to the earth ground. That's the earth ground symbol. Connection to ground on here that is now shorting out that diode. So, so now that's all hooked up. And the reason, John, that we still hook up the ground is typically for noise. It is typically for noise. In, in electronics, we have... It's very common. You build a circuit to do something. You design a circuit. You say, this is the way I want to build it and make it. And then you fire it up and weird things appear, like weird pulses. And I'm, I'm trying to simplify this. Um, interference from other things that are on the circuit, uh, inductances and, 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 and mutual capacitances that kind of are screwing stuff up. So it, it's, it's, it's quite common in electronics in general to have some kind of a thingy, a circuit, with usually you know, some kind of a little capacitor, maybe a 0 0.01 microfarad capacitor, or something connected to ground to suck off noise. And I'm really super simplifying this. What's weird about this, John, and, and, and I, I know you've encountered this because you're asking about it, in some, let me just sit down for a second. Hang on. Stand by, stand by, stand by, stand by, stand by. In some cases, you got like weird noise on the screen. Like typically it takes the form of like herringbone interference. You see like diagonal lines and dots and like weird crap on the screen. And, and oh, it doesn't, it isn't grounded. And you put an earth ground on it right from the green wire of the AC power plug right to the chassis and it goes away. In other cases, I've had a bunch of noise. Oh, chassis grounded. What happens if I take the ground off? And you take the ground off, and it looks beautiful. So, I mean, we, we there are things known as ground loops. Just because something is grounded doesn't specifically mean there's nothing on it. Uh, you know, if I have a thin conductor that's my ground conductor, I can have all kinds of weird noise on that thing unless it's, you know, this far from earth ground and really super connected to earth ground. There's noise on things. And, and so that's why we connect that other earth ground typically. But does it have to be there? No. And is it preventing a shock? No.
It is not preventing any sort of a shock, as far as I know, anyway. I run them all the time without earth ground during the, uh, during the 80s when I was doing my, my live class. Uh, my students would just bring in their old monitors. People would drive in with trucks full of old monitors. And we had monitor labs. We actually worked on them. And we would simply plug them right into the wall. No isolation transformer whatsoever. Just being real careful. And we'd fix them, and it would be, and it would be fine. And nobody got shocked. So, actually, there was one guy that got shocked. He decided he wanted to discharge the second anode, but he forgot one important step: turning the monitor off. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So he melted the end of the little screwdriver. We, we everybody in the class called him screwdriver after that. <laughs> I mean, he 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 drew a big old orange arc off of the thing, you know, and it, it yelled and it scared the hell out of him. It didn't shock him, but it scared the hell out of him. So so anyway, so I hope that's a, an answer to your question. I had a transformer a couple weeks ago. I posted on Facebook. Um, I think the secondary blew on it. And it started smoking. <clears throat> and I had plumes and plumes of smoke coming out of it. And then it just burst into flames. I mean, it was a big flame that came out of it. And I did it. It was outside, so uh, there, there was no damage, but it, it actually surprised me. <laughs> it's fun to watch. Uh, if if uh, you guys want to see destruction, electronic destruction, hang on a second. Uh, hang on a second. I'm not that fast a typer <laughs> on, on this laptop. There's a, a YouTube uh, channel called Photonic Induction. I think it's one word, Photonic Induction. And he's a, he's a high voltage nut that blows up stuff. You really want to look at every video he's put up there. He's a guy from England, really fantastic. Uh, built a 50,000 amp transformer that dimmed his entire neighborhood. It was like really fantastic. It's just, just great. So uh, 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 Brad asked a question about uh, how much current from the high voltage line to the flyback. You mean the second anode going up there, I'm guessing? Wow, I've never measured that. I got no idea how much I'm, I think it's probably 100 microamps or something like that, but I really don't know. Any ideas, Paul? Ah, I have no idea. Are you talking about voltage? Is he asking about the voltage? No, he's asking about current. He said how much current on the high voltage line no flyback. No idea. If, if you're really asking about, uh, oh, you're welcome, uh, uh, John. Um, uh, yeah, if you're asking about voltage, it's typically about 1,100, 1,200 uh, volts per diagonal inch, kind of. So like on a 19-inch TV, it's you know, 20 kilovolts, 21 kilovolts, something like that. 35-inch TV, 35, 38 thousand volts something like that but i don't know how much current i don't know uh, i no that's different from beam current yeah i don't know i don't know that anybody would ever measure it you would it would not it'd be nothing that i could measure that's for sure you know these be arcing all over the place i got a couple oddball uh, monitors uh, that i haven't i've never actually solved maybe uh, you have some input randy sure uh, i had one d7700 uh, when you would flip it on, uh, you wouldn't get full deflection, and it would look like uh, the the yoke wasn't operating properly. Uh, it would be uh, maybe three quarters of the deflection was working, and it looked like uh, uh, the purity and the uh, the convergence was all off. So it but sounds it, like yoke to me, huh? Yeah, but if I would flip uh, the test switch. And uh, put it on like a, a completely yellow screen or, or red screen, it would be perfect. Flip it back to the game, and the game will work perfect. Oh my! And yeah, so that's was, go ahead. Yeah, it's oddball stuff like that. It was in a centipede, which is mostly a black screen. So uh, it just flipped it on the centipede. Eventually, it would uh, uh, get full deflection and it looked fine. But when you first put it on, if you had a, a full color screen, it would be perfect. Then you flip it back to the game, and it's wow. fine. Weird. Uh, yeah, that's a uh, – yeah, I don't know. That's a weird – that is I, so weird. I have no idea. to do stuff like that that I have no idea uh, what's going on with them. Uh, D7700, is this a microprocessor control monitor? I'm not, I'm not quite sure what you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, it's, it's a digital monitor from Wells Gardner, 19 Yeah, Yeah, it sounds like programmer microprocessor to me. Have you changed the microprocessor in any of those yet? Uh – not yet. You know, it was in my collection, and uh, I would just hit the test switch, and it would uh, uh, give me full deflection, flip it back, and it worked, so I just left it as is. 
See, you know, I, don't the the I mean, obviously, none of the hardware is bad if that's the case. So it really yeah. kind of has to be the program itself, or and or the microprocessor. And I would I would tend to think it's 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 ROM. Is there a separate ROM in that? I can't remember. I don't think so. The microprocessor's program, isn't it? Uh, yes, I believe that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, which you would never find as a replacement part, probably. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I run oh, here's a nice stuff like that quite a bit. Let me read something from April here. Hello, April. Uh, why do old cabinets have a giant? I don't know. I don't know, I don't know oh, <laughs> what's the difference? Uh, the only difference between the big, big transformers and the smaller ones is, is well, two differences: how much current they can provide and the cost of them. The, the isolation transformers are shrinking because China can make them really cheap, and they're barely good for one amp. In other words, or an amp and a half or whatever, they put in the minimum size isolation transformer that will do the job where in the past they just said well either we're just going to throw a, a bodacious isolation winding on our main power transformer like Williams did um, or like Pac-Man where it has the separate isolation transformer and it's a pretty nice transformer pretty 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 well built uh, I did have a chance when I was in uh, China, in Taiwan, visiting Peter Chow, the, you know, the power supplies made by Peter Chow. I, he's a friend of mine, and I went to his factory, and I went to his house even. Um, and there's an area uh, in Taiwan that's all electronics. And uh, Peter said, well, do you want to see a transformer factory? And I went, heck yeah, I want to see a transformer factory. Let's go. So we just kind of walked down the street, and there's this... It's not like manufacturing like you think. I always thought of Chinese manufacturing as these white buildings with long tables and ladies wearing hairnets and like that. It's not. It's like a garage, a dirty garage with a dirt with a cement floor with one Chinese dude in his underwear smoking cigarettes operating a winding machine. And this is how they're put together. He has a turn counter. He winds the thing, takes the what's called the bobbin out of it, sticks the new bobbin and in winds it and then just assembles the core through the bobbin and it's just like a couple men job and and it's just cheap and dirty so um so the answer is higher current and they didn't need to spend that money so they didn't for the more modern ones so, april wherever you are it's funny this display i used to see everybody up at the top of the display and now i don't i'm so stupid i can't figure this out show participant video Maybe nobody has their videos turned on except John and you. I don't know. Yeah, you might find the uh, grid view on your top right hand. There'll be a... Oh, yeah, grid view. Yeah, there it is. Yeah. Ah, there you are. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Hey, everybody. Oh, hi. How are you? <laughs> hey, Jason. <laughs> so I guess it's just us five. Is there anybody else? Oh, no. Brad and Brian. Brian. That's a funny way to spell Brian. Did you spell your name correctly, Brian? Just kidding. Okay, so does anybody have any other questions? What's uh, what can I do? What's your for favorite you? uh, classic chassis? What do you think is the most dependable out of, from the last forty years, if anything? It's hard to believe Geo Sevens are still running. I'd have to give it credit. Uh, I guess I would. It's Canadian, which I am too. So yay. Mm -hmm. um, um, I've been to the Wells Gardner Monitor Factory. You know, it's interesting too that the, the Wells Gardner, what we call the forty six hundred, the one with the vertical boards plugged in, yep, yep. was really a monitor that Wells Gardner manufactured for J C Penney and Montgomery Ward. I uh, I was doing a class once in uh, Tennessee. I got to my really cheap motel room. Uh, the TV wasn't working right. And I had all my tools with me. So I said, what the heck? Let's just open it up. And I opened it up, and it was so surprising. Inside, it was the K4600, and the only difference was the vertical board that plugs in for our video. It, you know how it now has other circuitry on it to allow it to hook up an antenna and all that kind of mm -hmm. stuff. But uh, that was pretty funny. So, um, so that's not one of a, a good one. I, you know... I like the 4600. It worked really well for a long time. They even made a medium res version of it. Everyone's familiar with the K7000. Pretty darn reliable for the most part. Easy to fix. Um, I kind of didn't like it when they started moving to digitals and the D9200s and all those digital monitors. Mm -hmm. I wrote a really long series of articles 
because I had to learn how digital electronics works and vis-a-vis -vis monitors. And, man, I like it simple. I just like it simple. Maybe I'm not that good a technician. I don't know. But, you know, when you run into problems like you, Paul, where, gee, is it a software issue or is it a hardware issue? I don't right, know. Right. It's software control now. So, so. I don't really have a favorite, though. I'm not into it like you guys are. For me, it's just a job fixing electronics. I'm not. Uh, I'm not in love with any of the hardware, in any way. You know, for me, the more it breaks, the better I am. Right? It's job security, so I kind of, I kind of like things to break. It's, it's what I do for a living. Sort of did. Anyway. Twenty easy. Uh, yeah, not. This is probably one of my least favorite monitors in the world, and a lot of you are stuck with it, unfortunately. You know, it's 100 volts, number one, so it, you got you can't just put it on your bench and, and screw around with it. Um, I got a special setup for Sanyo's. Do you? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, so the early ones had negative video, which was really bizarre. So you had to invert, had a video inversion board, which was kind mm -hmm. of weird. Yeah, no, not my favorite. You guys are, are honestly working on some stuff that can be very difficult to keep this stuff working. And I, I really admire some of, yeah, there you go. <laughs> John. I really admire easy. some of, of, of your, your um, dedication to the hobby where you're really trying to get original buttons and screws and stuff like that. I mean, it's not, it's not me. I, I'm happy to help you with the technical <laughs> stuff, but I don't do that kind of stuff. <laughs> Daniel EC is a great monitor. Um, it's pretty straightforward to work on as well. Um, the parts are pretty still re readily available. Uh, there's a lot of uh, the flyback, the aftermarket flybacks are great on them. I don't think I've had one aftermarket flyback fail on me yet. Wow. Well, mm -hmm. good to know. It's, it's nice to have you in the group, Paul, for these things because you have a lot of input. Oh, oh thank I, you. Yeah. I, hey, Jason, have we met, Jason? Have we uh, met? No, you look no. so familiar. Oh, okay. no. uh, right. We haven't met, but uh, I'm happy to be your friend now and <laughs> happy you're doing these videos. Yeah, well, thanks. Uh, thanks. Paul, on the, on the EZs, I've, I've been rebuilding a lot of them uh, for some Donkey Kongs that I'm putting together for a contest. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of the Kong Off. But, Many uh, times, yep, yep. Yeah, so I'm going to have the cabinets, assuming we have one with, with the pandemic going on, but... Um, I've had a problem where I cap them and I, the flyback's good and then the flyback will just go out. You know, the new fly, or not the old flyback will. So I've just started putting in the new flyback automatically while I got it all apart now. But uh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a chore to take them apart just to do a cap kit on them. Yeah. Uh, like a K7000 where you could just yank it out, uh, recap it, and put it back in. Uh, it, it takes me about 15 minutes to actually take my time and pull the chassis out, pull the soundboard out, make sure everything is out nice. You got to be very careful with these guys because they're very, very fragile. Yes. Uh, if you look at them wrong, they could crack. So uh, The plastic's all brittle. Everything like the convergence ring assembly can just crumble in your hands. Yep. You know, it's, that's that's, a, that's kind of a weird deal. I just, uh, I just ended up fixing my Sanyo Easy. Well, I fixed it the first time, and then... I had it on the bench and I powered it up with 115 volt on my ISO and started to smoke stuff. Yeah. So I turned it off and uh, I looked at the caps and they were over voltaged, a lot of them. So I put all new caps in it and then it wasn't sinking horizontally. So that horizontal pot in, it's kind of in the middle of the board at a 3000 uh, ohm. So I couldn't find anything that had a normal footprint. So I ended up, uh, putting something with some wires, you know, a couple That's inches fine. away. I do that. And I it ran, ran beautiful now. It's back up and running. And, uh, yeah, it's uh, – but the fact that I turned it on with 115 or so volts, it didn't like it. Yeah, it surprises me that the voltage regulator – uh, let, let me back up. It surprises me that you said that the capacitors were over-voltaged. Uh, I mean – past the once you get past the power supply it should all be the same it should only be your power supply that blew up so that's kind of weird i'm but i'm also curious about something every question for everybody john and, and paul and everybody i'm really surprised by this comment that i've heard from several people where i right, put in all new capacitors in the monitor and the flyback blew up for the life of me i cannot imagine what recapping a monitor would do to 
caused a flyback to fail, a flyback that must have been compromised somehow, I suppose, previously to fail. Do you have any input on that, anybody? I've seen that many times already. I don't know why they fail, but you can recap it. They can immediately, when you power it on, they can last an hour. They can last uh, for years. It's uh, hit or miss. Wow. Hang on a second. April, sorry, say it again, please, from the beginning. Yes, GO7, every time, every time we do a GO7 when it happens. And it's it's kind of a it's a hit or miss because it's either either you stick with the old flyback and you hope that it's good enough, or you put in a new one and the new ones are just as cheap and crappy and then they blow too. So I don't even work on the GO7s anymore because I can't stand the fly box the way they blow. Oh, wow. You know, I, I certainly can see where if the horizontal output transistor is blown because of a bad flyback, you throw in a new transistor and then the flyback breaks in half. <clears throat> but I just find it so amazing that a monitor that was kind of working but just needed caps, and then you put caps in and the flyback blows. That's just, of course, if you had 25,000 volts floating around your head for 40 years, you'd probably be in trouble too. So, yeah, I guess. Anything else? <clears throat> oh yeah. Uh, when I first, <coughs> back to the Sanyo EZs, when I the first one I ever did years ago, this is kind of a funny, not funny story. I, I was so proud of myself. I got it. I got it all back together. It looked good. I was crossing my fingers, hoping everything was going to be fine. I put it back in. As soon as I turned it on, the PCB blew up. The soundboard blew up. And you could see the soundboard capacitors just start to bubble up. And I was like, I shut it down. I was like, what's going on here? Then I, uh, all the caps are fine. Everything was perfect. There's a, on the soundboard, there's uh, several connectors. There's a JC connector and a JP a B connector that are keyed exactly the same. And if you switch those, it blows everything up. Yep, I think you're muted. Yep, I say that to myself every time I'm putting that. I go, "This is JB, this is JC." I read them. <laughs> yep, I always double. Yep. Since then, I always double check myself yep. just to be safe. I always, uh, oh, I always I take a lot of. I draw. I, I take a marker and draw a line across both ends, and then those colors have to match the line, and then that way you know you have the right one. You mean just using just using a sharpie pen? Yep. Yeah, smart idea. It's always a great idea to do that. Take photographs and and just mark stuff. I you know do it all the time. It's it was uh, completely my fault and lesson learned. Yeah, sure. You only do that once, yep. hopefully. Yeah, before yeah. I take it, anything apart, I take photos and photos and more photos before I take it apart because I'll never remember some of it. Hmm. I could, Brad, go into <clears throat> switch mode power supply theory. We do have over a half an hour. Um, would that be interesting to anybody here? I actually had a switch mode power supply problem. Um, you usually, when you're diagnosing one, do you attach a light bulb to it to test it to make sure it's uh, working properly? Is you should problem? always test every power supply with a load, if at all possible, of some kind. And a light bulb is a real cheap, if you can still get incandescent bulbs, uh, is a real cheap and easy way to do it. I have a, a, quite a few, 25, 40, 60, and 100 watt incandescent several of each that I have packed in and put away because those aren't going to be available in 20 years probably right here. Yep. You know? yep. so uh, so they make they make great loads you just use a regular 120 volt light bulb for a, like a, a B plus power supply and a monitor um, some switching power supplies won't even fire up without an adequate load and many power supplies they're they're fine until you load them then they drop to nothing so, so I can go into SPM uh, switch mode power supply. I'd be theory. definitely interested in it. Okay. Some, All right. Well, here we go. Like that April, would you be interested in that, or do you know that, or do you care? April. April. Interested in anything? I mean, right. um, I don't know. I don't know if you know who I am, but my yeah. husband and I we we restore the the games for the National Video Game Museum here in Texas. Oh, okay. So, cool. Anything you give me, I will appreciate you. Okay, fine. All right, Juana, are you ready? Because this is really going to be crazy for you. You need some basic electronic training. 
obviously. But are you ready? You're smiling, so here yeah, we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, no, I just want to say um, I have this little yeah. Sony Trinitron, and then that has <laughs> uh, the AC. Um, AC doesn't work, so I bought this like car adapter for it, and then through the DC it works. So I think oh, the power so your AC is power supply has yeah. failed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. That's kind of cool to let you do that. All right, well then this yeah. this is yeah, uh, that, 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 yes. this is germane to your issue. All right, well, <clears throat> I'm not going to go into um, uh, any specific kind of power supply. Just uh, just the switch mode power supply. Let's see if I can do this. Hang on. Sorry. Whoops. Sorry, stand by. <laughs> okay. So, um, hmm. it's kind of weird to start with switch mode power supplies when I really haven't gone over linear supplies with you, but they're just so darn simple linear supplies. I'm, I'm guessing. But this will go for you. All right, let's see how this works. So, uh, you know, what the heck is a power supply? Just just for the sake of, of starting this discussion. <laughs> uh, everybody cool? Okay. Power supply. Yep. Yep. Uh, so, um, the purpose of a power supply is that it takes alternating current in and gives you direct current out. Uh, AC is really good for some things like power distribution and motors and stuff, but we need DC for electronics. So the power supply changes AC to DC. In addition to that, of course, it also can change the voltage. It's not required to do that, but typically we have 120 volts AC in and, you know, something else out. You might have a low voltage power supply that's 12 volts. You might have a B plus power supply in a monitor that's 120 volts like it is in the D the G07, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, that's what the power supply is actually doing. <clears throat> so the way a switch mode power supply works is that in a switch mode power supply, the very first thing that happens to the 120 volts AC coming in is that it is rectified and turned into DC, exactly like it was in the input of a of a of a uh, of an electro home monitor or a K7000. The AC power first thing it goes to is a bridge rectifier. But we don't require an isolation transformer in this case because there's another transformer that I'm going to show you in just a bit here that provides the isolation. So there's a bridge rectifier, and this is connected to earth ground. That's the earth ground symbol. Here's the output of the bridge rectifier, and we create a DC power supply here. And typical value for this thing is, that can be anywhere, 220 microfarads, 330 microfarads, could be 680 or something. Um, but the voltage right here will be approximately 160 to 170 volts DC. As you may or may not know, anytime you turn alternating current into direct current, the DC well, seems to come out higher than the AC that you put in there. It isn't really, and I'm not going to take the time to explain uh, the difference between RMS and peak voltage. You don't really care. All you, all you want to know is that that capacitor has about 160 or 170 volts on it. And you have to be careful, as you know, this capacitor can, in some cases, remain charged even after you turn the monitor off. So you have to be careful about not touching that thing. In some power supplies, there is a bleeder resistor across it. In some power supplies, there might be like a one meg ohm resistor that we refer to as a bleeder, um, so that when you unplug the power supply, the main primary filter capacitor, as it's called, will discharge. So this thing is called the primary filter capacitor, easy to identify. It's always the largest capacitor in the monitor. Can't miss it the big high voltage cap in the monitor. So this creates a power supply that's about 160 or 170 volts DC. But we can't use this to power anything yet 
for a couple of reasons. Number one, it is un. It might, well, number one, it might be the wrong voltage. You might only want 120 volts or 12 volts or something like that. But number two, it's also unregulated, meaning that as the AC power might fluctuate in voltage, so will this output uh, fluctuate in voltage. And we, you can't have that in a monitor. If the power supply voltage fluctuated, the size of the picture would change. Well, it would be worse than that. So, so we have to regulate this voltage. So, so here's the plus 160 that we just made coming from wherever it is. Can you guys see over here? Everybody? Yes. Yeah, you can see here. Okay. So th there's the 160 volts DC that we just made in the way you just saw. And that's typically not anything that fails. None of that stuff fails. So that is connected to the primary winding of the transformer, the power transformer. I, I wish I could just show you a picture of it. If I was more on, on board, I suppose I would Google some images. Uh, Anyway, it's the yellow transformer that sits right in the middle of the power supply, typically, or somewhere in the power supply. It's a ferrite core transformer, which technically is drawn with a dashed core like that. And then <clears throat> over here is the, the transformer, and here is the output side of the transformer. So on the output side of the transformer here, there are a number of windings typically, because we have, might have a lot of outputs. So you might have something like in a monitor, one of the outputs might be 125 volts DC. That might be what's known as the video B+, which we discussed in a previous discussion. One of the windings might be you know, 90 volts DC or 100 volts DC or 120, 100 or something like that. That is the main B plus power supply that powers everything, the horizontal output transistor, horizontal output circuit, and all that kind of stuff. And you probably might even have a 12 volt winding. There might be a 12 volt, uh, whoops, I shouldn't say DC. Um, um, there might be a 12 volt winding here. Uh, in some mon in some power supplies in monitors, let's see, you can't can you see you can't see down here. Here's as low as you can see. Um, there might even be a winding that's uh, that drives the heaters, the the 6.3 volts equivalent that drives the heaters. But I made a mistake here. I wrote DC, and that's not what it is because this is AC coming out of the transformer. Sorry about that. This is AC coming out of the transformer. The transformer takes the 160 volts DC and somehow mysteriously turns it back into AC in a way I'm going to show you shortly. But as you should know, a transformer is strictly an AC device. Transformers only works on AC. It has nothing to do with direct current whatsoever. Whoa, but that's pretty weird because I put DC on the input. What, Randy, what the hell are you talking about? Here's the deal. Take this with a grain of salt for the moment. The output of the output of the transformer is AC, so it does have to be rectified once more. So typically, one side of the uh, winding is grounded, like a chassis ground. There, notice this ground was different from the earth ground I used previously, and they will use typically just one diode. Sometimes it's two, but typically it's just a single diode here. Now, we used a bridge rectifier on the input because it was only 60 hertz. Remember, the AC power is coming in at 60 hertz. But this AC that's coming out here isn't 60 cycles per second. The AC coming out here is super high frequency. It depends on the power supply. But it might be 30 kilohertz. It might be 50 kilohertz. So many power supplies are even 100 kilohertz now. It's much higher frequency, and that's why the transformer is so small. The high operating frequency of a switch mode power supply allows us to use a much smaller transformer. As frequencies increase, components get smaller. And, and so that's one of the reasons why we have switch mode power supplies. But because it's operating at such a high frequency, we don't need all the pulses. Just to remind you, with a bridge rectifier, the way a bridge rectifier works is we get a pulse that comes out that side, and then we get another pulse that comes out that side. So we get pulse, 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 pulse. But in this case, we only have one rectifier. It's called a half-wave power supply. But the pulses are coming along so fast, we have plenty of pulses. So just a single diode, and, and these are special high-speed diodes, as most of you know. Because of the high operating frequency, you can't use like regular 
diodes there. These have to be special high speed diodes. Make sure that you replace those with high speed diodes. So, so then we have our, our outputs. And so, and there might be a coil here as well, an inductor to help reduce the noise but you you might now we have 125 volts dc that's like the video b plus we'll have another diode here maybe a coil a filter capacitor um here and this might be you know again 90 volts dc or 100 or 47 it could be anything really and you know same same thing down here now in our in our switch mode power supplies that are for the five volts the uh, let me just draw one big secondary here, like uh, the the five volt power supplies that are five and twelve and minus five and all that. The five volts typically we use a dual diode assembly. For the five volt power supply, the 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 winding is center tapped, if you know what that is, and it is grounded, and it uses two diodes for the five volt. Typically, almost always. There are two diodes with their cathodes tied together, and this is one component. This is a single component. Let's see, you can see over here, yeah. It is two diodes with their cathodes tied together. The center leg is like that, and all of this is one part. It's been my experience. They've been extraordinarily reliable, and I'm also in the slot machine business, and there are some slot machine power supplies that are very complicated and difficult to work on that blow up the Schottky rectifier, as it's called, the 5-volt rectifier. But I don't see this much in our industry, in the amusement industry at all. Usually that's totally reliable. And then, and then uh, typically there's a, a couple of filters. Typically you have, and again, this is for like the 5-volt DC power supply. You'll have one capacitor that is like, you know, 2200 microfarads or 1000 microfarads, and then an inductor, a coil, and then yet another capacitor right here. And this whole network right here, and that's five volts coming out, uh, this whole network right here is known as a pi filter, pi filter, because it looks, you know, kind of like the letter pi. So it's called a pi filter. And so that's so that's how we make the DC output. That's pretty darn simple. Is everybody okay with that so far? I don't want to move yep. on too fast. Everybody cool? Did April leave? She's her camera's gone. But anyway. I'm okay. here. Oh, all right. Um, so now I want to move back over here to the primary side. This is called the secondary side. The output of the transformer is the secondary, and it's really straightforward. It's just a couple of diodes and excuse me, a couple of diodes and two capacitors, so that's pretty simple. Here's the big deal. Let me see how much time I got left here. Perfect. Okay. So um, this is, I wouldn't say it's complex, but this is interesting. So here we go. So if you remember... We made this 160 volts DC. It came off the AC power. You know, there's a big filter capacitor here. We don't care about that so much. Whoops, wrong ground. Uh, and it goes to the primary winding of the power transformer. The bottom end of the transformer is connected to either a bipolar junction transistor, probably not in modern stuff, or a MOSFET. So there's another kind of transistor known as a MOSFET, metal oxide semiconductor field effect transistor. And it's like a super good transistor. Earlier in this discussion, I talked a little bit about how the regular transistor can be like a, a zillion million ohms or it can be zero ohms or anything in between. Um, but the MOSFET is really a switch. It's just either completely on or completely off. And a MOSFET, the specifications are just voltage and current as far as we're concerned. Uh, there's no gain. Remember that H sub FE thingy? We don't have that. It's just voltage and current. And substituting a MOSFET is super easy. You can use any MOSFET as long as the voltage is the same or higher or the current is the same or higher. And what's kind of cool about a MOSFET too, just to take a second and talk about it, is sometimes, not always, you can tell what the... Um, 
uh, specifications of the part are by the part number. For example, you could have a MOSFET that was a 10N60. So <clears throat> that would be a 10 amp transistor. It would be N channel. They, they, you know how transistors are NPN or PNP with MOSFETs that are similar, but it's known as N channel or P channel because the way the MOSFET is constructed, there's like a channel in there, which you don't care about. Um, and then, the, and then the 60 means it's 600 volts. So if I had an 8P40, that's 8 amps, P channel FET, 400 volts. So as long as the first number is, is the same or higher, this has to be the same. You can't substitute N for P. And, and then this number is the same or higher, you can substitute them. Anyway, so, so the MOSFET is the switchy thing that completes the circuit to ground. We looked at this previously when we looked at the horizontal output transistor. There was a transistor where the emitter was connected to ground. So this is a, a thing called a MOSFET. It's an N-channel MOSFET because the arrow is pointing this direction. Um, and this lead is known as the source. Oh, you can't see that, can you? Uh, source. Oh, can you see the MOSFET? Let me, let me tilt down a little bit here. Hang on. So can we see down here? OK, yeah. Good. So um, yep. this lead here is known as the source, S-O-U-R-C-E, the source. The thing that used to be called the emitter is now referred to as the source. The thing that used to be the collector we now call the drain. And the controlling element that turns it on and off is now known as the gate. Instead of the base, it's called the gate. Turning on a MOSFET is called gating. So anyway, so it's just a switch here, and this guy goes to ground, essentially, not really. It really goes to a, like a 0.22 ohm resistor to ground. Can we see down here? Can we see? Yes, just barely. Okay. So remember that this thing, this is the transformer that, you know, has the secondary windings and the diodes and all, all that crap on it. We don't care about that stuff now. So the way that this works is pretty simple. This MOSFET is controlled by an integrated circuit or some circuitry. Um, there's some kind of a circuit that drives this thing. And this thing is known, this, let's, I'm going to make sure you can see this. Can you, can, can you see all the way to here? I can see. Okay. So this integrated circuit or circuitry made of other parts is known as the PWM controller. It's called the PWM controller. It happens to stand for pulse width modulation, M-O-D-U-L-A-T-I-O-N. PWM, pulse width modulation. To modulate something means to change it. That's all. Just a fancy word for change is, is modulation. So here's, here's the thing. Here's the way it works. When this transistor is off, of course, there's no electric current flowing. When this transistor, when the MOSFET turn, uh, when the MOSFET turns on, the 160 volts flows through the primary winding. Uh oh, Andy, I think your uh, your your video switch cameras or something. Yeah. Oh, what the heck happened there? Okay. Did I lose my? Oh, I lost my USB camera. Oh, stand by. I tripped on it. And I, I pulled it out here. No. Sorry. Oh my. What did I do? All right. Sorry. Stand by. Do that. Uh oh. Uh oh. Oh, this is bad. This is bad. Uh. Okay, stand by. I'm taking my headphones off. Stand by. Watch So how long have you guys been repairing arcades? I've been doing it about 15 years. Wow, very cool. I actually have a little uh, slide business going on repairing monitors, and um, 
I've, I've become pretty proficient at uh, doing the classic uh, Geo 7s, 4900s, anything up to everything uh, except the digitals. I don't mess with digital monitors. Yeah, I send everything I don't want to mess with to Paul. <laughs> Sorry, this isn't uh, isn't going very well. Hang on, stand by. I tripped on something and did something terrible. Wow. Uh, well, thanks for coming. I don't know what I did. I tripped on something and now I'm all embarrassed. Uh, let me see if I can switch. Yeah, stand on. No worries. <clears throat> wow. So, it's lost US. Uh, let me just try resetting the same thing. Stand by. I'll probably just. Well, Paul, I will say I do appreciate it when you fix our chassis. That is helpful. Thank you. Um, I appreciate that. When I first started, I was working on a 4900. And I'll, I'll never forget this. Years ago, I did everything I could to get it working. And it was just completely dead. And then one day, I was just looking at the, the, the chassis itself, the, the solder points and everything. And I noticed... A hairline crack um, on the flyback. It was just on a trace. You could barely see it. And I was thinking to myself, there is no way that I spent this many hours on this. And it could have been that. So I, I jumped the trace, and, and the sucker fired right up. I was jumping up and down. I brought my wife into the garage. I was like, look, look what I did. Look what I did. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. After that, I was kind of hooked on fixing monitors. Yeah, I know what you mean. Can, can, can you guys hear me okay? Yep. Okay. Yeah, I know what you mean. It's such a thrill. Um, I, I call it the dance in your underpants. Um, and that's kind of what I do. I mean, I just do a little dance. And it's even if it's a part that I've changed a hundred times that, that I know exactly, you know, what's going on, um, it's still very thrilling. Okay. Whoops, that didn't work. All right, stand by. I need to get some tape. I'll be back in two, one minute less. Okay, we can chat. I remember spending hours, I mean, I think days even, trying to figure out why I wasn't getting any, any green on a monitor. And then it, uh, it turned out it was my TPG. <laughs> my test, pa test pattern generator wasn't outputting green. <laughs> oh, I can't hear you. What happened? Oh, it sound? I don't know. I can't hear. Yeah, it's funny. I, I had a sim. I'm just going to do this. So the board is smaller now from your perspective. Sorry, the board is smaller now from your perspective. Uh -huh. Can you? Can everybody see it? Yes. Yep. Yes. Okay. All right. Cool. All right. So, uh, <laughs> so to get back to this, I'm so sorry. Um, so when the MOSFET is turned on, the current flow, everybody okay? Sorry? Fire. You're cutting out whoever's speaking. It isn't working. Shall I finish this? Shall I move on? Okay. Thank you. All right. So 160 volts DC flows through the primary winding of the transformer through the MOSFET from drain to source and eventually makes its way to ground. That builds up a magnetic field, as you know. That's how transformers work. When the current flows through it, it builds up a big magnetic field. Then this transistor is turned off. The PWM controller device turns this thing off. The magnetic field collapses. So the magnetic field is moving. It's building up and collapsing which it has to do to make a transformer work. In order for a transformer to work, which is really looking for AC, we're getting it DC, but by by chopping it up. Yeah, what? What? Everything okay? Can you hear me? Give me thumbs up, everybody. Okay. I keep hearing weird stuff. Um, uh, 
the way transformer works is the magnetic field has to move. It has to build up and collapse, and that's what's doing. And he and doing. And here's the secret. Here's the secret. Wake up. Wake up. Wake up. The longer this transistor is allowed to remain energized versus not energized, the bigger the magnetic field is and the higher the output voltage is. That's how it actually, that's how it actually uh, changes, uh, regulates the output voltage by the, the, what's called the pulse width, the amount of time that this is left on versus off. So let me draw a quick graph and show you what I'm talking about here. Hang on. Stand by, stand by, stand by, stand by. So um, I'm going to draw a, gra a graph here of the on and off times of that MOSFET. So like when everything is working normally and groovy and everything is perfect, here's what we might be seeing on the MOSFET. Here's where the MOSFET is off. Here's where it's on. Here's where it's off. Here's where it's on. It's off here. It's on here. It's off here. It's on here. It's off here. So when you look at this, it's off for, and this is kind of arbitrary. Uh, it's off. It's on for maybe 25% of the time, and it's off for about 75% of the time or so. We refer to this as the duty cycle. It's called the duty cycle. This would be a 25% duty cycle. <laughs> he said duty, <laughs> uh, duty cycle, All right? So when everything's go going groovy, that's what happens. Well, somehow in a way that I can't discuss today, but I will in the future, happily, the, the, the power supply, that PWM controller chip is always sniffing the output of the power supply. It's always checking to see what the output of the power supply is. If for some reason the power supply output voltage were to drop, let's say, maybe because the AC power coming in uh, dropped, um, um, it's going gonna, it's gonna to see that and say, wow, man, your, your voltage is dropping, and it's going to make the pulse width wider. Well, it's time in the horizontal direction. This is time versus voltage. If I make the pulses wider, what I really mean is I'm leaving the transistor on for a longer period of time that builds up a bigger magnetic field and the output comes back up to where it should be. If let's say the output voltage was too high, like maybe the AC input jumped for some reason, again, the PWM controller chip detects that in a way I'll talk about maybe sometime um, and says, whoa, yo, bra, your voltage is too high. Let's cut back on the pulse width. Let's modulate it. Let's make it narrower. And that brings the voltage back down to what it should be. So that's how the PW, the uh, the switch mode power supply regulates the output. It doesn't waste power with heat like a re like a linear power supply does, where the regulator gets hot. It simply just doesn't make any extra voltage. It only makes exactly what it needs. Now the output isn't really fluctuating up and down. That's the opposite of what we want, right? We want it to be regulated. It's not really. Um, fluctuating up and down because this is happening 30,000 times a second, 30 or 50,000 times a second, that PWM controller chip is always sniffing the output. And if the output drops a tiny bit by like, I'm guessing a thousandth of a volt, uh, one thirty thousandth of a, a second later, it will make the pulses exactly a tiny bit wider to bring it back up that thousandth of a volt, and, and, and then it's perfect. So it isn't really fluctuating up and down. 30,000 times a second, it's sampling the output and controlling the pulse width. It's called PWM. Well, once you know what PWM is and... Uh, and now you know, you see it everywhere. It's it's really the way we control everything. Like if you want to dim a light, um, we PWM it. In a pinball machine, and you guys aren't pinball guys, but but in a pinball machine to make the, the lights get brighter and dimmer, they don't change the voltage going to the, the light bulbs. They PWM them. If they make the pulses narrower, the light is dimmer. If they make the pulses wider, it's uh, it's brighter. So... Does that kind of make sense? I, I mean, I do have a more comprehensive lecture on this, and I'll be glad to do it in the future.
Cool. Everybody, anybody? Yeah, yeah. sounds good. Thank you, Randy. It was yeah. good. Yeah. Uh, let's see. I'll turn, I'll turn this one on. Hey, Amy. Andy, um, I saw before previously on your YouTube channel, you used to have like a, a basic electronics um, YouTube video. Uh, is, it, is it still up on there? No, I, I'm trying to rearrange my channel at the moment. I'm just putting okay. copies of these videos up there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I do have this stuff available on DVD, but I think you can find a lot of this stuff online. If you want to just look. There's lots of people doing basically Anything else? Okay, well, thank you very much for coming. I'll put this all, you know, put this recording up, and uh, I'll put the link up. And uh, thanks for coming. We'll next week. Thanks, Randy. Awesome. Thank you. Vote, vote, thank vote, you. vote, vote, vote. Okay, vote thanks, Randy. Vote. You're welcome. My pleasure. Thanks a lot. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye. Yeah. Thank you.